So I've got one file here, and let's go ahead and try to edit this file with the ed editor. All right, so looks like maybe the program is hanging. Uh, there's a question mark. Maybe if I kill it, I can exit. Control C. That doesn't do anything. What if I try quit? Exit. Uh, help. Um, uh, all right. That didn't go very well. If you've ever tried to use the ED editor before, this is probably what your experience looked like. The reason why ED is so confusing and hard to use is because it's an extremely old text editor. The earliest versions of ED are from the late 1960s, during the early days of Unix. Amazingly, ED still comes installed by default on most modern Linux distributions. You're probably wondering why this editor doesn't look similar to other command line editors like Vim or Nano. In order to make sense of this ancient editor, it helps to think about the way that people interacted with computers back in the early days of computing. Back in the 1960s and early 70s, a common way to get information out of a computer was just to print it on paper. Some of these early machines were called teleprinters, and they basically just looked like electronic typewriters. The thought process behind the design of these machines was basically just left over from the early days of telegraph communication. The abbreviation TTY is a reference to these old devices this abbreviation is still in use today. Chances are, if you list your devices in dev TTY, you'll find more than a few of them. Eventually, the design process moved toward printing on electronic screens. So in order to explain why the ED editor works the way it does, I've set up a fairly contrived, but hopefully fairly instructive demo here. So what I have here is a very simple model that is hopefully gonna help me explain how a terminal works the setup here should illustrate the core concept, not only between ancient teletype terminals, but also modern Linux terminals. So every time you open Vim with syntax highlighting or run git status, all that kind of stuff can be explained in terms of this fundamental concept. So here I have a Raspberry Pi. In this case, that represents the ancient mainframe computer, or it could represent the CPU inside your modern desktop computer, or it could even represent a Raspberry Pi. The core idea is that the computer we want to input and output from is right here. The purpose of this device is for performing serial communications. In our example, it's connected via a USB to the Raspberry Pi. The actual USB connection is not relevant here. And what we want to focus on is the TX and RX pins. TX stands for transmit and RX stands for receive. Note that the TX is connected to the green wire. So when you're thinking about what goes through this green wire here, it's basically just an infinite sequence of characters communicated serially. So it's just one character after the other. And the exact same thing is true of the orange wire here. And I've taken the green wire and just stuck it into this pen. And for the purpose of this example, we're just going to imagine that this pen is somehow magic. And at each stage, it just keeps writing characters one after another, and it never goes back. And for the orange wire, we're going to pretend that this is our keyboard. Now obviously this doesn't function anything like a keyboard because there's no actual circuitry, but really it's just a prop to show you that if you were sufficiently motivated, you could wire up something here so that you could communicate characters one by one serially over this orange wire here. And every time you press a button here, that corresponds to a key on your keyboard, and you can just set up the circuitry to send those all down this one wire put it in uh, ASCII or, you know, and using whatever kind of modulation you want. Now, there's a couple things you might be wondering about this setup. In a typical terminal on Linux, if you press keys on the keyboard, they will immediately show up in your terminal. But that doesn't always have to be the case. What actually has to happen is you press a key, the key goes through the serial input, it's received by the processor, and then the processor has to explicitly echo it back onto the terminal. This is called echoing the characters. And in fact, it's a common requirement to disable this. So normally when I type on the command line, you can see all the characters that get echoed back. But if I run stty minus echo, now you can't see anything. So if I type ls and date, so the commands are still running and the, in the input is still going into the computer and the shell is still registering it but it's just not getting echoed back to me. And if I type S 
tty space echo, even though you can't see what I'm typing, now it comes back and I can type ls and date and you actually see it. The second thing you might be wondering is if you're just infinitely writing characters on the page, how could you possibly implement something like Vim on a piece of paper? Doesn't that break the model? For example, when you're editing a file in Vim, there might be information here, down here, like the name of the file. And in Vim, you can obviously navigate around. So you could go to the top of the file and modify some things here and go down here and check the line number. But you can also scroll up and down in the terminal. So that doesn't really seem to fit. And you might think that there's a completely different model that's used here. And it, it can't possibly be just serial output, but it actually is. So to prove it to you, I'm going to run a command called script. And what script will do is it will save all of the information that's being output in this terminal session so that I can go and inspect it later in the file. So we'll start script. And if I run Vim now, so you can see there is a piece of text in my file in Vim. And here's all this stuff printed at the bottom, stuff that you would not really expect to be output as serial. And then if I quit Vim and exit from the logging session from script, and if I type ls, here's my historical log of everything that was output to the terminal. So if I open that again in Vim, you can see this first statement from where it started recording. On the next line, you can see the echoed back terminal command that was output when I was opening Vim. And on the next line, you can see a whole bunch of uh, weird brackets and all kinds of confusing looking characters. Now these characters look like a bunch of jumbled nonsense, but they actually do something very special. These are called ANSI escape codes. There are all kinds of escape codes for setting things like the foreground and background colors of text, and most importantly, you can use them for moving the cursor to arbitrary positions. So as you can see, the output for Vim doesn't really look like serial output, but it actually is. So if we were to try and run Vim on an old teletype printer, we would still see some of the characters that we expect, but we'd also get this jumbled mess of ANSI escape codes. In the old days, these escape sequences were not meant to be interpreted by the processor, but rather by the physical terminal monitor that the user would look at. This terminal output from the session with Vim looks almost incomprehensible, but you'll be happy to learn about the dash R flag with less. This flag allows you to render the color escape sequences this output doesn't look exactly like Vim, but as you can see, it's a lot closer and more recognizable. For example, note these characters on the side. This is not actually in Vim, this is in less. If you scroll down, you can see some of the output from when Vim tried to update the screen. To get an idea of what Vim would look like if we tried to run it with the output as an old mechanical teletype that printed to paper, we can take our saved script and delete the first and last lines, and then print it to a file. Interestingly, when I tried this, my printer didn't respond well and did something that I haven't seen before. It just says data remaining and it doesn't print. If I then try printing a test page, it does print out the first page. My best guess is that since this printer isn't a display terminal, it doesn't know how to deal with some of the escape sequences. And it gets confused at some point, waiting for more input. As you can see, the output doesn't look very useful and I didn't expect it to. Since I happen to know a few ed commands, let's try editing that file again. I'll use the script command again so we can log all of the terminal output to a file. In order to view the contents of a file in ed, you have to explicitly tell the editor which lines of the file to print out. To do this, you can type the line number and then press enter. To add text to the file, you can type the a key and then press enter. Then type your text. To stop adding more text to the file, you can type the period key on a line by itself and then press enter. To show all lines in the file, you can use this command. To save and exit, you can type wq and then press enter, just like in Vim. Now let's exit the script. Now let's try printing everything that was captured in that terminal session with the ed command. So here is the result of our two terminal sessions, one with Vim and one with the ed command. 
So this is what the output of vim looks like when printed on a piece of paper. And this is what the output of the ed command looks like when printed on paper. Now, looking at the output of these two editors, tell me, which editor would you prefer if you had to print all the output on paper? Another thing that can make the ed command difficult to use is the fact that the man page isn't very helpful. If you check the man page, you'll see that none of the commands that I used are in this page. You can also try doing ed-h, and you'll find that the help messages here aren't useful either. At the end of the man page, you'll also note that you can use the info command to get more information about ed. You'll find that the info command has much more useful information. For example, you'll find information about all the different commands and modes that ed offers. Realistically, you should think of the ed command almost as though it's another type of shell. If you open up a new shell, it won't do anything unless you tell it to do something. It'll just sit there with a blinking cursor. Using ed is just like using any other shell, where you have to think carefully about what you want to input and output. Individual commands are required in order to get it to do anything at all. Most of these commands are short single letter commands. This was very common in the early days of Unix.